Hello, hello. Thank you all. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I want to take a step back and uh, tell you how I got to, to Teddy Roosevelt via Abraham Lincoln. Um, and I think it's something that Teddy Roosevelt would be very pleased about. Roosevelt was a huge fan of Abraham Lincoln. He had pictures of Abraham Lincoln. He would always say when he would have a hard decision, he would like to think about what would Lincoln do. Um, in fact, there's a, uh, a great picture that was just found relatively, um, you know, in the last 50 years or so that was uncovered of what is a child, Theodore Roosevelt, in 1865, actually watching the Lincoln procession from his window of his grandfather's house. Um, and it's an amazing photo that um, as someone researching the Lincoln procession happened to come upon and when looking up the address, realized that was the home of Roosevelt's grandfather, and there were two little kids in the window. Um, and the, um, uh, Roosevelt's wife in the late 40s confirmed that that was, in fact, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, who was at the house. It's a great image to go look up. Um, and, and probably the, the, um, the, the biggest connection um, between them at least as far as I'm concerned, is the person who transcribed an important trial that Lincoln did. And let me t tell you why I'm taking that step back. My co-author, David Fisher, who is um, equally responsible for everything that we do, um, came to me a few years back and he said, you know, there's this great trial out there uh, that Abraham Lincoln argued from 1859, nine months before he got the Republican nomination. And there's a transcript of it, and it's the only trial that's ever been transcribed that Lincoln argued. And it was discovered in the garage of the great-grandson of the defendant in the 1980s, and no one has written about it. And I said, come on. Oh, there's a transcript of Lincoln's trial in the garage, and no one's written about it. <laughs> yeah, right. He was absolutely right. And so that took us into our first partnership together, which was for Lincoln's last trial, which was um, our first book together, which chronicles the uh, case, a really compelling murder trial that Abraham Lincoln uh, was the defense attorney for in September of 1859. And it was, a, as you can imagine, a critical time for him. He did not think he was going to win uh, in 1860 the nomination. He was moving forward with his practice as an attorney, but it put him back in the limelight. And it became an important uh, trial for him. I'm not going to talk too much about, about that case in that book. Um, that's for, a, for another day. But the person who transcribed that trial, Robert Hitt, um, had been someone who had transcribed the Lincoln-Douglas debates for Lincoln. Douglas had his own transcriber. And amazingly, they didn't match up. Uh, and, uh, and so Lincoln trusted Hitt um, as his guy. Um, and so Lincoln convinced the family of the defendant in this murder case to do something very unusual, which was to get someone to come to court, not an official court transcriber, and sit in the back and write down everything that was happening in the trial. Um, and Hitt did that, 101 pages, handwritten um, in shorthand. Um, and this became his uh, craft and his profession. And after that, he became a well-known member of Congress. Uh, he became um, chair of the Foreign Relations Committee. And in 1904, he was Theodore Roosevelt's number one choice to be his vice presidential candidate. Um, and Roosevelt got convinced by the, the party um, I'm going to call them party bosses, but that's the whole point of the book. The, the party bosses, that there was a better choice um, to make. And he was frustrated, 
and he agreed to do it. And that leads me into how, I came, how we came to the story in the Roosevelt book, which is a battle between Theodore Roosevelt and the party bosses. And I say this about Hitt to say that, you know, Roosevelt hated the idea of caving to what was politically expedient. Um, he wanted to do what he wanted to do. Um, he was um, very independent in his views, and that is reflected in this, in this trial. So let me take you back to, to this trial and, and the battle that ensued between Theodore Roosevelt and William Barnes, who was the head of the Republican Party. Um, and he was the exact party boss that Roosevelt came to loathe, and had loathed even when he was governor of New York in the 1890s. Um, Roosevelt didn't want the vice president uh, position when he was asked uh, to take it with McKinley. Um, he felt it was a dead-end job. He liked what he was doing. The party bosses wanted him out of New York because they couldn't control him. And they wanted him in a less influential position. And so they convinced him, well, I shouldn't say they, McKinley ultimately convinced him. But he was ultimately convinced to take the position of vice president. But it, it's the story of his war with party bosses that goes back as far as the 1890s. 1904, even on the Robert Hitt issue. And now in 1912, Theodore Roosevelt has returned from his African safari for a year. He, was, he left the presidency as one of the most popular presidents. He was one of the most famous people in the world. He comes back and he's frustrated by what he sees that Taft has been doing as president. He does not feel that Taft has been implementing his, more, his progressive policies, and he's getting complaints from a lot of his inner circle when he returns from Africa. And they go through a, a series of back and forth, and the question becomes, how important does Roosevelt become in the Republican Party? And in 1910, he beats the party bosses um, in, a, in a critical New York State fight. And it became very, because it became between Barnes and Roosevelt. And Barnes is the guy who ends up suing Roosevelt in this trial. Um, for who was going to be the chair, at least the acting chair of the Republican Party in 1910. It became a very important role. And it was actually Roosevelt's last significant political victory, was in 1910. But it leads eventually to Roosevelt deciding to run for president again in 1912. And one of the biggest fights that Roosevelt had had with Barnes and with the Republican Party was Roosevelt believed that senators should be elected directly by the people, as opposed to by the state legislature, which was the case at that time. The legislators would pick uh, the senators. And so his position was that this is wrong, that this is undemocratic, um, and that the people should be electing senators. And of course, there was a lot of resistance from the party bosses. And this, is, this was one of his critical issues in 1910, 1911, 1912. He runs for president against Taft and Wilson. Uh, he feels that Barnes steals the Republican nomination from him, that the Republican um, party bosses the Republican Party system had unfairly rigged the system against him. And some of his arguments were legitimate about how it went down in 1912. Um, and he loses the Republican nomination that he felt that he should have won and would have won if everyone was voting directly. And remember, of course, even these days with caucuses, we don't still vote directly in all primaries. Um, but he felt that, he, um, that the nomination had been stolen from him in 1912. He creates the Bull Moose Party. He runs. He gets more votes than Taft. 
who was the Republican nominee by a lot, but he and Taft split the vote of the Republicans and the people who are um, inclined to vote with them, and Woodrow Wilson becomes president. So we move to 1914, and there's an, um, a nonpartisan candidate running for governor of New York um, of, of neither party, and Roosevelt supports him for governor. And he issues a statement that becomes the subject of the lawsuit, which is in the book. And I'm going to read to you the, the words that Roosevelt used that got, him, that got him sued. The head of the Democratic Party's name was Murphy, and Barnes was the head of the Republican Party. And Roosevelt's position was both of them together wanted to keep preventing people from voting for senators directly. Mr. Murphy and Mr. Barnes are of exactly the same moral and political type. Not one shadow of good comes from the substituting of one or the other in control of our government. Skipping forward. The interests of Mr. Barnes and Mr. Murphy are fundamentally identical, and when the issues between popular rights and corrupt and machine-ruled government is clearly drawn, the two bosses will always be found fighting on the same side, openly or covertly giving one another such support as we can with safety be rendered. Yet they form the all-powerful invisible government, which is responsible for the maladministration and corruption in the public office, offices of the state. That's what Roosevelt got sued for. Can you imagine today? I mean, it's like, whatever. Uh, uh, but he accused Murphy and Barnes of being corrupt and involved in a corrupt alliance. And Murphy let it go and didn't think about it too much. But for Barnes, there were a number of reasons why we think he ultimately sued Roosevelt. He had his own political ambitions. I think in part he was convinced by his lawyer. Um, but he sues Theodore Roosevelt for $50,000 for libel for making that comment. And back then, the legal standards were different. These days, and Barnes would have been considered a public figure, someone who's the head of the Republican um, Party, that these days, in order to win a lawsuit like that, you would have to show what's called actual malice. You'd have to be able to show that the person knew or should have known that what they were saying was false. Back then, they had something called libel per se, which means, basically, was it defamatory? Was it something that could hurt the person's reputation? And if the answer to that was yes, the burden shifted immediately, in this case to Roosevelt, to prove that the statements were true. Now, this case was a huge deal in 1915. The New York Times was sometimes devoting 10 to 12 single-spaced pages to what was happening in the case. It went on for six weeks in Syracuse, New York. Theodore Roosevelt, the former president of the United States, had to move his life to Syracuse to defend this case. And I don't want to say that he was happy to do it, but he sure was um, energized because he viewed this case as an opportunity to some degree to defend his legacy. Because one of the things that was most important to Roosevelt was this idea of being a straight shooter who wanted to root out corruption, particularly in government. And his view was what he had said was talking about corruption in government. And there's nothing more important than corruption in government. And so Roosevelt embraced to some degree this trial. Now, this was, you know, financially, Roosevelt had been quite well off. He'd, he'd, he'd um, made some terrible investments in the 1880s in, in cattle, where he lost much of the inheritance that he'd gotten. He was still writing an enormous number of books. But a lot of the time he was writing the books because he needed the money. Um, and my point in saying this is, back then, 50,000 is a little over what would be about a million or so today. It mattered uh, to him. 
Not saying couldn't afford it, but it wasn't nothing financially for him as well. Um, and so this trial um, where Theodore Roosevelt takes the stand for eight days in his own defense. And one of the things that I love about this story is that we've seen Theodore Roosevelt's speeches. We've read them. You can actually hear some of them. Um, but this is Theodore Roosevelt completely impromptu. This is Theodore Roosevelt being cross-examined about his life and his career. And the plaintiff is accusing him of all sorts of wrongdoing. Um, and, and I think that what may, that's what kind of makes this so special, is that you get to see Theodore Roosevelt in his own words, not in a prepared speech, not in prepared remarks, but defending himself, explaining how he wanted to be remembered to some degree. Um, and so I say, I, I mentioned the Lincoln book at the beginning. M my co-author and I have decided that each of our books are going to be based on a transcript. The Lincoln uh, book was the transcript of Robert Hitt. This is a 4,000-page transcript uh, of the trial. Um, very different than the Lincoln one. In Lincoln, it was 101 pages of just witnesses, no opening statements, no closing arguments, nothing from the judge. Here we have every word uh, from the case. I will say that my next book, which comes out in three weeks, is on John Adams uh, defending the British soldiers in the Boston Massacre case. And amazingly, there was a form of transcript from that trial um, from 1770 um, in the trial of the British soldiers. Um, and so that's our next uh, venture, sort of looking at different areas of the law, the law being created in the Adams, developing in Lincoln, really coming to maturity in, in Roosevelt. Um, and the transcript, we hope, comes to life in the book. And it was a lot of work just going through the transcript, as you can imagine. But let me just read you, just to give you a flavor. And those of you who know Roosevelt, who've studied Roosevelt, I think will appreciate some of the back and forth um, without getting into the specifics of each issue they were fighting over. The, uh, the opposing lawyer, William Ivins, uh, and again, this is the guy who, who many believe convinced Barnes to sue. Um, I think Barnes may have been on the fence about whether this was a good idea. And Ivins was convinced he was going to be able to take Roosevelt down and make sure that he would never be able to run for political office again. Ivins says to him, how do you know that he's talking about something that Roosevelt had done as chairman in a, in a role in his past? How do you know that substantial justice was done? And then we write that the colonel literally yelled out his answer with delight, because I did it. Because I was conducting the investigation and doing my best. Ivan says, you mean thereby to say that when you do a thing, that you thereby know that substantial justice is done? And Roosevelt says, I do. And when I do a thing, I do it to substantial justice. I mean just that. It is so Roosevelt. Um, <laughs> And, 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 and then later on uh, in the transcript, it says, I attack iniquities. I attack wrongdoing. I try to choose the time for an attack when I can get the bulk of people to accept the principles for which I stand. Um, and then the lawyer says, I think you've answered the question. You stand by righteousness, do you not? I do. I stand by righteousness always. Ivans, with due regard to opportunism? No, sir. When it comes to righteousness, but you must, for righteousness, you must stand whether you're going to be supported or not, just exactly as I did while I was governor. Ivans then um, says to him, did that rule apply to Mr. Barnes in 1912 with regard to righteousness and the opportunities for expression as well as it does to you? Has not every man an equal right to determine his own rule for righteousness and his own time of applying it? He says, he has if he's got the root of righteousness in him. If he's a wrongdoer, he has not. <laughs> he says, Ivan says to him, who is the judge? And this is, he's getting into it. I mean, this is, who is the judge, you or he? And Roosevelt starts gesticulating. Um, 
It may be that I have to be the judge of him if I had to be the judge. Um, and then, and I'm now skipping forward uh, later on. Um, Ivan's. It is not possible that somebody else may have to be the judge of your misconduct? And Roosevelt says, it is possible. It is not impossible that you should be guilty of misconduct beyond criticism or comment, is it? And Roosevelt says, it is not impossible that I should be guilty of conduct that would cause criticism and comment. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I read this just to say that, again, this is Teddy Roosevelt. This is the essence of Teddy Roosevelt. And this is not prepared remarks. This is cross-examination in a trial with a guy who's trying to bring him down. Um, one of the other um, interesting things uh, about the book, a couple more interesting things, is Franklin Roosevelt ends up testifying for Theodore Roosevelt. He walks into court. Um, he is the exact same job that Roosevelt had had as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. He has um, just completed time in the New York State Legislature, um, as, had Rose, as had Theodore Roosevelt. Um, and he actually has substantive testimony to offer, as it turns out. He's not just there to be a character witness for Theodore Roosevelt. They are of opposing parties. And remember I told you that the allegation is that Murphy, the head of the Democratic Party, and Barnes were working together well, Franklin Roosevelt had been a part of the Democratic Party and had talked to Barnes about some of the exact issues that came up in this case about direct election of senators and the question of whether Barnes and Murphy may have been in cahoots together. And Franklin Roosevelt had relevant testimony with regard to conversations he had had with Barnes and Murphy about this issue. And so, you know, at the time when we were reading all of the coverage, Franklin Roosevelt wasn't Franklin Roosevelt. He was just, you know, Theodore's fifth cousin, uh, who was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, which was, you know, big deal, but he wasn't Franklin Roosevelt. Um, and, and so, again, you get to see Franklin Roosevelt in the context of this trial, in his own words, um, unscripted, not quite as much about his legacy, obviously, etc. It's more specific to the, to the trial, but that's a a fascinating uh, moment in the case. And one of the other things that was really fascinating about this was the time of when this trial happened. This is happening in the lead up to World War I. Um, and there were three German uh, Americans who were on the jury. And at that point, if you were here and you were a German American, very likely you were first generation, maybe second generation, but still with a close affinity to Germany. And Roosevelt had been criticized extensively by Germans for being uh, uh, too uh, hawkish in terms of World War I, about wanting to get into the war on behalf of the United States. And he was very, you know, his lawyers were very concerned about these three Germans as to whether they were going to hold that against Roosevelt when it came to time for a verdict. And during the trial, near the end of the trial, the Lusitania was sunk. And you may remember that there were over 100 Americans who were on the ship who were killed. And the United States had to make a decision about how to respond. Of course, the first person they want to call for a response is Theodore Roosevelt. The media wants to know, what does Theodore Roosevelt think about the sinking of the Lusitania? What does Theodore Roosevelt think the United States should do? Um, and his lawyers, as you can imagine, um, wanted him to say nothing. Um, they were very concerned about how this could impact the case. And of course, Theodore Roosevelt was Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> and he offered commentary about how he thought this was just another indication of why the United States needed to be more involved. And I will say this about um, the lead up to the, to the verdict in this case. For those of you who haven't read the book, 
Um, and, and, and I will say that, that, you know, typically in a story like this, people will know the ending, right? If you haven't read the book, you're not going to know the ending. You know why? Because almost no one knows about, knew about this story. I mean, Edmund Mor Morris, in you know, the terrific um, uh, three-part um, biography of Teddy Roosevelt, has one chapter in the last one, in Colonel Roosevelt, about, about this um, trial. But I think he minimizes it significantly. Um, he sort of treats it as if it's kind of a, a little embarrassing interlude in Roosevelt's life. And I will tell you that Theodore Roosevelt cared enormously about this. Um, and I guess I'll, I will give away the, the verdict. In t in, <laughs> but let me, bef yeah. before I give away the verdict, let me say this. Because I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give away the verdict by, by giving you an example of how important this was to Theodore Roosevelt. The verdict in this case was out of a movie, meaning the jury comes back and says they have a verdict, and as it turns out, there's a problem. That part I won't give away. There's a problem with the jury. There's a problem one of the jurors is not ready to vote um, in favor of, of Roosevelt. And it's a fascinating moment. Now, Roosevelt's team thought he was going to lose or there would be a hung jury. Again, it was defamatory. He said it. Um, being able to prove this corruption was not easy. When Roosevelt eventually prevailed, his team was shocked. And by the way, even the coverage, it's so amazing. The coverage, as the jury's deliberating, the coverage is all sort of suggesting, you know, this doesn't look good for Roosevelt. I mean, everyone thought either hung jury or Roosevelt's going to lose. When Roosevelt won, he updated his Who's Who in America page <laughs> to include having won this trial. Meaning, he had to take things off about White House accomplishments to put in this trial. And I think that that just shows you how much he cared. I mean, think about it. Six weeks is a long time for the former president of the United States, one of the most famous people in the world, to be spending in a small courtroom in Syracuse, New York. And so, and I'll take, uh, I'll take some questions, but I think that, you know, one of the, the things that I got so excited about as we dug in here, in particular as I read all the coverage and I saw the, the headlines uh, everywhere, we saw that day after day there was this breathless coverage of this trial that somehow had become a footnote to history. Um, as we dug in, the thing that I got more excited about was, again, how much this meant to Roosevelt. I mean, even the little things. On weekends, he would sometimes cancel a trip home because he wanted to huddle with his lawyers to make sure that they were making the right arguments, etc. This wasn't just obligatory for him. This was a big deal uh, for him. Um, and remember, this is also a time when Roosevelt had future political aspirations. Many thought that Roosevelt would run for president in 20, 20, 1920, uh, not 2020, uh, which has been my life lately. Uh, yeah, uh, 1920, um, that he would be, that, yes, that he'd be running for president again. Of course, Roosevelt died in 1919. Um, so um, so it, was a, it was a fascinating uh, piece of history it was fascinating to work on, um, and uh, I'm happy to take uh, questions about any of the books or even the Adams book or what's going on in the world, um, uh, uh, et cetera. So, uh, yes, uh, questions, sir, in the orange. The question was, yeah. Yeah.
The question was, uh, do I think that arrogance has to go hand in hand with a populist president and self-righteousness? Um, I think that uh, there definitely has to be uh, confidence, um, uh, whether it necessarily would have to be arrogance. Um, you know, I, I'd want to, I'm now thinking through our most populist of political leaders. There's no question that the populist political leaders are going to be um, great orders, um, and that probably requires a level of uh, confidence. Um, again, sure, there's going to be some who are going to be arrogant. Look, and, and, and there are um, many similarities and differences between you know, Theodore Roosevelt and, and Donald Trump. I mean, I, I'll tell you that, that one thing that people, I, I think, have overlooked, and I've become a big fan of Theodore Roosevelt, uh, the more research I've done, the more I have come to appreciate him. And, um, and I will say that um, one of the things that I think he did, which was uh, disappointing and um, sort of outrageous, was that he prosecuted the media, not criticized, not sued, used the Department of Justice to prosecute members of the media for saying things that he didn't like about him. Um, there was an allegation that he had, this, this uh, paper had suggested that in the Panama Canal deal that he'd skimmed maybe, may, they, they suggested that, where did the money go? They were saying skimming money was a question uh, with regard to the Panama Canal deal. And Roosevelt was so angry that he um, prosecuted them and actually that case, and, and using language, by the way, from the Alien and Sedition Acts, um, uh, speaking of John Adams, uh, to, uh, um, to, to, to do that. And eventually, even though he left office and the Taft administration continued defending uh, the case in the appellate court, and ultimately it was thrown out and somewhat ridiculed, um, but I, I would just say that, you know, there are, um, you know, we, we can look back at history and uh, there are definitely going to be comparisons, similarities and differences between populists, non-populists, um, et cetera. So, um, yeah. Yes, sir. Going back to TR's trial. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's a good question. So the question was um, I, uh, whether they were able to sequester the jury um, those days as they were as they were deliberating. Um, yes, during the deliberations, uh, they were sequestered. They were not sequestered during the trial. Um, and remember, sequestering any jury for a six-week trial, even today, people sort of assume that if it's a high-profile case, the jury will be sequestered. It's very rare that you sequester a jury for the entirety of a trial. They were uh, put up at the jail. Uh, is, uh, they, they got the, the, the lovely um, accommodations um, of being at the local jail. Um, and uh, um, that's where they were sequestered as they were, um, you know, as they were deliberating. Exactly. Well, and, you know, one of the interesting things is, again, you know, we've become, one of the things I thought was particularly interesting in looking at the Lincoln case versus Roosevelt is how much more formalized the legal system had become between 1859 and 1915. But still, as the jurors were deliberating, um, they ended up waking up and one juror, the one juror who was the holdout, ended up just going to the foreman and saying, hey, by the way, Let's talk about that issue. And they start talking about it with only a few of them there. And then some of the other, like these days, that would be, you know, mistrial, right? The idea that not all the jurors were there for every piece of conversation. Um, and then it was, oh, yeah, you know, I woke up. I, I talked to the foreman. And so there was still a level of, of, of informality, but they were sequestered. And the judge was instructing them, as a judge would today, do not read anything about the case they wouldn't be saying don't watch anything, but as they do today, but it was do not read anything about the case because this was in particular in Syracuse and in, as I said, even with the Times, but in Syracuse as well, it was everywhere. Um, and so 
Um, and, and look, and there were, you know, there were real losses for Roosevelt, legal losses during the trial uh, that were, you know, that were pretty big uh, setbacks. And, you know, one of the, and I just sort of bring you into the, um, the mindset of, of us as we were writing the book, one of the challenges in writing the book was that the, the biggest legal issue in the case became whether to admit evidence that Barnes had been involved in a, um, a scheme to get state dollars for a printing business. Barnes owned newspapers. He also was getting some nice cash on the side, printing books, etc., for the state. And it sure seems like he was getting money for things that he wasn't really doing. And the Roosevelt team wanted to introduce that, to say, this is corruption. And the Barnes team said that's not the corruption he was talking about. Um, it shouldn't be relevant in the context of the trial. And it became one of the single most important things in the case, and it was boring. So we had to decide. It's so important in the context of the trial. There was so much testimony about it, but it's boring. So, so what's the balance? And we ended up putting in, you know, what I hoped was a summarized version of, you know, the, the checks and the ownership and this, but, you know, the occasional critiques of the book said maybe they went on too long about the printing evidence. <laughs> so, you know, there you have it. Yes? Did Franklin Roosevelt defame Murphy and Barnes? No. He wasn't, Franklin Roosevelt wasn't there to say that, um, that you know, Mur well, look, I should say this. Franklin Roosevelt, like Theodore Roosevelt, wanted the direct election of senators. He was a Democrat. Roosevelt was a Republican. They both wanted the direct election of senators. Um, and what Roosevelt was really talking about, Franklin Roosevelt, was about conversations he'd had with Barnes, essentially about whether the, the, the fix was in. Um, and it wasn't to say the fix was in on who got picked, but more about the process. Um, so I wouldn't say it was defamatory, but his testimony was definitely helpful to Theodore Roosevelt in proving that Barnes and Murphy had some level of communication over this question. Because there was a particular fight over a particular election where they couldn't muster enough of a majority to get a senator elected. And the question became, well, what are we going to do now? Um, because they couldn't get a, a majority. And so there was negotiation, there was deal making, et cetera. And as part of that, uh, some of these issues uh, came. I'm trying to avoid getting into the printing problem of, uh, of, of it getting a, a little boring. But, um, yes? Do I consider Theodore Roosevelt one of our very best presidents, and if so, why? I do. Um, I do. I, I think he's a, uh, a controversial president. I think there are people who are going to have criticisms, as I mentioned, um, of, of some of the things that he did. Um, but I think, you know, for example, on issues like the environment, um, you know, the national parks in this country are in many ways thanks to Theodore Roosevelt. Um, it was something that he cared enormously about. He thought about what's the future going to look like when it comes to climate. I mean, I, he wouldn't have called it climate change, just the climate um, and uh, the environment, et cetera. Um, you know, he was able, he really was... Um, successful in avoiding, you know, in negotiating on international affairs. Um, he got a Nobel Peace Prize uh, for it, um, f and I think deservedly so, for um, helping to um, avoid, uh, as much as he was considered in, by some to be a, a warmonger, um, he also was able to help negotiate out of wars. Um, and so, uh, and, and look, and look, it just may be the kind of person that I am, but digging in on the Lincoln book, I appreciated Abraham Lincoln. Digging in on the John Adams uh, book, 
I came to appreciate John Adams. But I, it was a different level for me with Theodore Roosevelt. With Theodore Roosevelt, I thought to myself, that's the kind of guy that I want. Um, that's the kind of person who I can identify with in many ways. There's certain things about him that were flawed. But um, he was independent-minded. He wasn't going to be um, beholden uh, to party. Uh, and I think, honestly, in, in the environment we're in today, we, it would be amazing to have more of that. Um, that sense of this is someone we can trust and who is not going to be accused of doing something just for the sake of party. Um, yes? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. So the question was whether, you know, looking at Lincoln, looking at Roosevelt, and looking at many of our other great presidents, many of them were accused of abusing their power. Many of them were accused of overstepping, and do I think that uh, many of our uh, greatest presidents um, uh, did that? Um, and uh, and the answer is um, yeah. I mean, I think that I think you have to. I mean, I think even when you look at Franklin Roosevelt, right? I mean, you know, I, I'm glad that he didn't pack the courts, um, but there's no question that Franklin Roosevelt uh, as well. I, I guess I would say though that part of that has been that the great presidents have often been responding to incredibly difficult times. And in incredibly difficult times, decisions have to be made that wouldn't typically be made. And so, so I think when judging um, you know, some of our, our, our greatest presidents, I mean, you particularly look at some of the overreach by Lincoln um, as a legal matter, um, I think we excuse it because we say we were in the middle of the Civil War. And, um, and there had to be certain things done that uh, wouldn't be acceptable otherwise. I think Franklin Roosevelt, the same thing with World War II, um, et cetera. Um, so uh, it's a good question. Um, uh, and, um, you know, I, I think that there's, that the question may be a leading one uh, to take me <laughs> on a thread where I'm not going to go. Um, but I appreciate it. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. Speaking of today, do I have an opinion on what the Iowa caucus um, outcome could be and what that could mean? Um, look, I am uh, the legal guy. I listen to my political folks um, on the, you know, what's going to happen in the Iowa caucus. I will say this. Um, whatever happens in the Iowa caucus, it's not going to be definitive. Um, that I think, <laughs> I think we are, and this is in part a media problem, we focus so much on Iowa because it's first. It's the first place. But coming back to Roosevelt again, it's a caucus. It's, it's not, this is not my alarm, is it? No, okay. Um, it's a, somebody's alarm was going off. Um, uh, it's, it's a caucus. It's not even a primary. Um, so, the fa you know, what the caucus voters in, in Iowa think is interesting, and it will be a great media narrative for a while, but there's a lot of money in this, um, on, uh, uh, for these candidates, and this is going to go long, which is why I'll say that while Bloomberg doesn't seem like a real candidate today, if this goes long enough, and it gets fractured enough, somebody like a Bloomberg could come in late in a way that never would have happened before. Um, so, yeah, all right, we got one, I got 40 seconds, yeah. Chief Justice sitting there hearing all this testimony, etc., and then he goes back and he's, he's ruling on cases. Yeah. Is it humanly possible not to be, as a lawyer, yeah. from the legal point of view, uh, impacted? Or, or I'm being asked about Chief Justice Roberts. And, um, and the fact that he's sitting there listening to all of this and then going back and listening to his cases, is it possible for him not to be impacted? Um, again, the cases that he's going to be ruling on with regard to Trump, um, 
aren't related to the issues directly that we're talking about. Now, on the question of his taxes, for example, is any of the stuff that he's going to have heard impact him? Is it going to impact any of the justices? I mean, my point is, like, all of them are listening. I mean, he's being forced to listen to all of it. <laughs> but, but the rest of them are still listening. I mean, they're not like jurors, right, where you say, you're not allowed to listen to this, you can't. And, and look, and I think my guess is that those Supreme Court justices all have a very good sense of how they're going to rule on those cases. And I will tell you that, in particular, when it comes to his taxes, the administration does not have a very strong argument. Um, they have a stronger argument on one of the three cases. But, but you know, look, his taxes are eventually going to come out. It's just a question of when. Um, and uh, and in, 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 you know, in what, and when I say that, I mean, you know, the same thing we talk about in the impeachment proceeding. History is eventually going to have answers to all this. We're going to see this stuff eventually. Some of it may be many years from now. But with Trump's taxes, I'm convinced that those are going to come out in the, uh, you know, the relatively near future, whether it's before the election, I don't know. But, uh, and, and by the way, I don't think it's going to have that much of an impact on the election anyway. I think even if his taxes come out, there was a New York Times article that did a full investigation about his taxes and his family and this and that, and it fell and people said, wait, what, what, what article? Um, so anyway, all right, thank you all very much.